We have talked a lot about pulling a vacuum, but you know what? There is so much more information we've also left out. This is the book you want to get if you want to be a professional with vacuum. It's called The Review of Vacuum for Service Engineers. It was originally written in 1959 by Standards and Williams. For the longest time, this book wasn't published. I had a copy of this book. I let a friend borrow it. He moved away, and I could not find a replacement. Luckily, Brian Orr and Jim Bergman came through and rewrote this book. They republished it, and they also updated it with new information. This book is incredible. I still reference this book, and it has a massive amount of information. All the information I left out is in here. The hows and the whys and the what ifs are all covered in this book. I highly recommend having this book, even if you don't read the book, just for a reference. I have no connection with this book, but I love it. In the description below, I'm going to have a link to where you can find this book. Now let's review all the stuff that we've learned about vacuum. Before we even pull a vacuum, we want to make sure we keep this system as clean, dry, and tight as possible. Making sure we keep the copper closed up and covered up. Making sure that while we're brazing, we purge nitrogen through. Here we have our nitrogen tank, our primary regulator, and we also have a flow regulator so we can softly, softly flow nitrogen. Ideally, in a perfect world, we'd be able to flow nitrogen anytime the system was open so that we keep that moisture out of that system. Keeping that system dry is going to be very, very important. So all that work we do before we even get here is going to be important. We also want to pressure test that system before we ever get to doing a vacuum to make sure it's not going to be leaking. It's going to be a lot of wasted time checking for a leak with the vacuum and also checking for a leak with the vacuum isn't as good. We want that pressure pushing out. That's the primary way of looking for a leak. Now, before we pull a vacuum, we take our nitrogen and we want to flow our nitrogen through that system and push out as many of that moisture or molecules of moisture before we ever get started with vacuum. So being able to purge, lightly purge with the flow regulator, flowing nitrogen through that system, not pressurized, helps and makes a big difference. And one of the things we also learned was it's dry nitrogen, but nitrogen does not absorb moisture. It helps push those molecules out, but it does not absorb moisture. It's not a sponge. It's not cleaning that moisture up. I'm also going to put a link below from Jeremy Smith, who talks about nitrogen and how nitrogen reacts with water. It's a great read. Now we have our pump. Before we get started talking about our pump, you make sure you RTFM, read the manual of that pump. Each pump's a little different. They have little specifics about how they want their pump started up. Some of them want you to leave a hose loose when you first start it up. The extension cord going to your pump is going to be very important. Too thin or too long of an extension cord can burn up your vacuum pump. The oil is going to be a big one. We want to make sure that we change the oil after every use or especially before long periods of use because the moisture is going to stay down at the bottom and that moisture can eat away a vacuum pump. Also, that vacuum pump oil is going to be able to make a good seal for us. So if we have moisture in there, it's not going to be a good seal. We can check that vacuum pump oil by doing a blank off test. We can put our micron gauge on the pump, making sure we're pulling down about 50 microns. If we pull down to 50 microns, we're typically in pretty good shape. What's more important than the pump itself is going to be the hoses, making sure we have good, thick quality hoses and they're vacuum rated hoses with no oil. So we're not using this for anything else other than vacuum that we use these good vacuum rated hoses all the way to the system. These vacuum rated hoses aren't going to permeate like your other hoses will. They don't have oil in them like your other hoses will. They're made for vacuum and they're large, thick and short as possible. On top of that, we want to make sure we remove those valve cores. The valve cores inside this system is a massive, massive restriction. They slow the flow down so incredibly much. So we use valve core removal tools to get that valve core out of the way so we can really flow all of that air and moisture and, and all those molecules out of that system as fast as possible. The hoses, those valve cores are key to a fast, good vacuum. Now you also want to make sure your connections are good. I started using a product several years ago called Nylog, and Nylog's great between all of these different connections. It helps seal that connection. I have no affiliation with this company. I just love their product because I personally used it. This product makes a seal between all the connections and it lasts much longer. I used to replace all my O-rings very often, and after using this product, I don't have to replace them nearly as much, so it's saving me money. Plus, making that good seal, I don't have to worry about, am I leaking at one of my connections? Because this seals it really, really well. Now, a lot of people worry about getting this in the system. Well, there's two kinds. We have the red and the blue. The red is for alkabenzaline and mineral oil, and the blue is for polyester oil. 
This works great. It's made of the refrigerant oil and really it should never get inside. People say, well, what if it gets inside? Really, I could probably put this inside the system and it's not gonna cause a problem. But the key is it doesn't go inside. It goes in all your connections where they seal together. It's nice and thick. It does make a mess. So you should have something to clean your fingers off after you're done, but it makes a great seal. So now you're pulling through the big hoses. All your connections are sealed up really, really well. Your valve core is removed. You're able to pull a vacuum nice and quickly. Now for pulling a vacuum, we need to be able to measure our vacuum. If we're not measuring, we are completely guessing. The analog gauge set, when people are looking at 29 inches of vacuum, that's not enough. There are 25,400 microns in one inch of mercury. So even if you could see that much of the needle, that needle's not gonna be nearly as accurate. So you could be at showing at 30 inches of mercury and still have 25,400 microns in there. It's just not possible to see it. So we need a micron gauge or a vacuum gauge. Nowadays we have digital micron gauges, which I love, but microns are not new. This is my first micron gauge, which is an analog gauge. It's not a new thing. Digital microns are the new thing, and it does make a huge difference. Me personally, I like to put a valve between my micron gauge and the system. What I found was doing pressure testing and flowing and adding refrigerant, it pushes all the oils from the system into the micron gauge and I had to clean my micron gauge all the time. Ever since I started using a valve between my micron gauge and my system, I haven't had to clean my micron gauge not one time. So it is an extra connection, but I tell you what, I do love the difference that it makes keep my micron gauge good and clean. Cleaning your micron gauge is still gonna be important. Make sure you follow your manufacturer's suggestions on that. Make sure you use what kind of cleaner they recommend for that. But also having your valve cores removed is gonna be important. If I have my micron gauge on the outside of my valve cores, I'm not getting an accurate reading of what's happening inside my valve cores. There could be several hundred microns difference between that, or even a thousand microns difference, as we saw in the examples before. So having those valve cores removed, I'm able to see what my microns are doing right here in the system. The micron gauge should be as far away from the pump as possible and as close to the system as possible. Ideally, we'd put it over here at our evaporator coil, far, far away so that we can see it. I do recommend some of the newer micron gauges. MeasureQuick has some that works with its app that you can actually record and save your microns as you pull a vacuum. So you can see that you're clean, dry, and tight and prove it to somebody else. It's not just your word for it. So microns are gonna be important to make sure that we measure it and know it. How deep should we go? Read the manufacturer's recommendations. Each manufacturer is different. Some say go down to 500 microns. Some say now go down to 100 microns or 250 microns. There's some other things we can do to speed that process up, such as energize the crankcase heater of the compressor, or we can use a tank heater on the compressor itself to heat that compressor up. It's doing two things. It's making the moisture or any old refrigerant in that oil boil out faster. It's keeping that oil thinner at a higher viscosity. It's also it's speeding up our vacuum. We can also heat up the condensing coil, which isn't as important as that oil. We can also turn the fan on on the inside, keep moving air, warm air across that evaporator coil so that we can keep that evaporator coil warm. The warmer we keep the coils and the warmer we keep the oil, the faster we can pull a the vacuum. Then we wanna make sure we do a decay test or an isolation test where we close the system off. We separate the hoses and the pump from the unit. We wanna see how fast our microns rise up over a certain amount of time. How much should that be? We wanna make sure we read the manufacturer's instructions. Some say this many microns over 15 minutes. Some say this many microns over an hour. So make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions. Typically under any scenario, they shouldn't rise above 500. So you wanna be looking to make sure your microns are below 500 after your decay test, after your isolation test, that it doesn't rise above 500. And some of these micron gauges work with the Measure Quick app and you can actually trace and see what that is. You can prove you did a decay test. Works out really well. If your microns are rising up nonstop, you have a leak. You missed a leak with your pressure test, you have some kind of leak in there, you need to go find it. It could be a leak at one of these connections, you may need to go apply a little bit more of this, or you may have a leak somewhere in the system. If the microns rise up to say 1,000, 1,500 microns, and then start to kind of level out, there's a good chance you still have moisture inside the system. That moisture is boiling from a liquid to vapor, that vapor pressure is raising up, and you're reading that vapor pressure at your micron gauge. So there's some of the three things we're looking for. Now your microns are gonna go up casually, even under the best scenario. That's just part of how things work. But the idea is they should level off, move up at a very slow rate. Now that we've proven we're in a low enough vacuum with our decay test or our isolation test, we're ready to add refrigerant. Now we have to get the refrigerant from the tank to the connection. 
Now, some people like to purge that hose using the refrigerant to push those contaminants out. Me personally, I like to pull a vacuum through that hose all the way to my tank. Whichever method you use, you wanna make sure you're getting it as clean as possible. You're not just connecting it, opening up, because all of the contaminants in that hose are being pushed into that system. So keeping that system clean, dry, and tight is gonna be very, very important. As we're adding refrigerant to the system, we wanna make sure we're adding it to the liquid line. So that liquid refrigerant's going to the liquid line, it's boiling from liquid to vapor. We only get vapor coming back to the suction line to protect our compressor. We do not want any liquid refrigerant coming to our compressor. We also want to measure and watch how much refrigerant we're putting in. We want to use our scale to make sure we're seeing how much refrigerant we're putting in and we wanna put in just less than what it came with. Every system is gonna be different. Just because it says it came with so many pounds of refrigerant on the tag doesn't mean it's how much it needs. The line sets, what cool it's working with, there's several factors. After you get the system up and running, you can do superheat and subcooling to finish off your charge. Now that we have positive pressure inside the lines, we can add our Schrader cores back in. Only when we have positive pressure. Don't try to put your Schrader cores back in while you're under a vacuum. So if we're in positive pressure, I can put this tool in, open the valve, slide it in. If I try doing that same step under a vacuum, well, as soon as I open that valve, all of that gap of air and contaminants and moisture are gonna be sucked right into that system. So make sure it's under positive pressure. That's why we have the refrigerant tank in there first. Now, once these shredder cores are back in, you're able to use whatever method you prefer, whether it's probes or digital gauges or analog gauge sets, you do your superheat and subcooling, and make sure your system has the right amount of refrigerant in the evaporator, right amount of refrigerant in the condenser, and before that, airflow, airflow, airflow. We don't wanna forget that. Now we can take all of our stuff away from the system, finish charging it like we normally would. Now vacuum and dehydration is probably the most overlooked part of an HVAC and refrigeration system. When you first install that system, you have one shot of pulling that vacuum right. If you don't pull that vacuum right, you end up with moisture inside that system, and that moisture turns to acid, even with mineral oil. But now we have polyester oil, and polyester oil used to be an acid. We dehydrated that acid to make it an oil. So as we get moisture back into that oil, it turns back into an acid. And that acid starts eating holes in the evaporator, eating holes in refrigerant line sets, eating holes in the condensing coil. But on top of that, all the copper that it ate away ends up copper plating inside the compressor, doing damage to the compressor. It also starts eating away the windings inside that compressor. It starts doing damage to that compressor. So even though you don't directly see the results of not pulling a proper vacuum, it reduces the life of that system. It starts eating away and doing damages to TXVs. It starts doing damage to the compressor. All of the components of the refrigeration system suffer from not pulling a proper vacuum. So just because you can get away with not pulling a proper vacuum doesn't mean it's a great idea. That's why I love some of the new digital equipment that you can prove that you pulled the proper vacuum, that you did the proper decay test, and it helped. That information, I think, is so valuable. It separates the people that are doing it right from the people that aren't. Now I can prove that I did it right. It's a nice little advantage. For me, though, it's important to know that I did a job right or did it to the best of my ability. We all make mistakes, and the mistakes are okay, but that is you're doing that job to the best of your ability. Even though you could cut a corner, you choose not to. And over time, you're gonna see that doing the vacuum the right way, the best practice way, will actually be a lot faster. It's gonna be a better for the system and it's gonna be saving you time. That first method with the two hoses seemed complicated going through it all step by step, but really it only takes just a few minutes to get that set up. Over time, you're gonna build up your habits and you're gonna ace and zip right through that without any problems whatsoever. And you're able to pull a vacuum deeper, tighter and drier than anybody else and also faster. And that's a win-win situation all the way around. Everybody wins. I know this has been a very long series and sometimes it really sucks, but what's more important to make sure that we are dehydrated, clean, dry, and tight.